Hi, I'm Donald Osborne, and welcome once again backstage at the Audrain Automobile Museum. I'm standing here between two Ferraris. They may not look like many of the Ferraris you expect to see, and for some they are their forgotten Ferraris. For me, they're among my favorite Ferraris. These are two Ferrari 400Is, a 1984 version here on my left and a 1981 on my right. Why are these cars the forgotten Ferraris? Well, think about it. Ferrari is one of the, if not the, best known car brand on the planet. If you're a little schoolgirl or schoolboy, if you're a teenager, if you're a young adult, if you're an adult, if you're a senior citizen, everyone knows Ferrari. Ferrari is a brand that has transcended the car world. Yes, of course, it's very famous around the world for its great success in motor racing, specifically Formula One, but Ferrari is known to people who don't know cars much as people who've never set foot inside an opera house know who Enrico Caruso was or Luciano Pavarotti. People who don't know an, an RBI from a GTI know that Babe Ruth meant something in baseball. And that's the kind of impact that Ferrari has had. But that impact comes from very exciting, visceral, loud, sort of noisy, in-your-face sports cars. These two cars clearly are not that. So, should we care about them as Ferraris? Well, let's take a look and see why we might. Leonardo Fioravanti at Pininfrina was an absolute master at designing cars to suit their purpose. And the purpose of this car was to provide a gentleman's express, an express for the gentleman and his friends and family. These cars are genuine four-seat Grand Tourers. They're the successor of the 365 GT 2 plus 2, which some nicknamed the Queen Mother because it was the biggest uh, Ferrari anyone had ever seen to that time. And they were designed to be a car to provide the effortless, powerful performance of every Ferrari product in a, an envelope that was quite not so much in your face. Remember the time in which they were created. It was the time of the Red Brigades in Italy, and the wealthy in Italy didn't necessarily want to show their wealth in a very dramatic way. That's one of the reasons why this car was so successful. In fact, it was introduced as a 365 GT 2 plus 2 in 1972, and production through that car, the successor 400, 400i, and the last 412, lasted until 1989. This is the longest running production run of any Ferrari of all time. They built nearly 3,000 of these cars, and they were extremely well received in their day by their owners. The press, however, was a little confused. Around this time, Pininfarina also had a design study called the Pinin for the first four-door Ferrari. I think it was a beautiful car. It was very well received when it was shown at shows, but Enzo Ferrari was not really sure that a four-door fit the image of Ferrari. He felt that with the 400, he was capturing that market already and still in a two-door model. Now, it's a very interesting thing because as these cars became older and then went into the collector realm, people began to say, well, they're not really Ferraris. They don't look like a Ferrari. They don't give the impression of a Ferrari. And so values lagged and interest lagged. People thought, well, they're not really the thing that I, that I want. But the reality is that these cars are amazing examples of the perfect product for their time and purpose. Enzo Ferrari and Pininfarina set out to make a car which was comfortable, powerful, and quiet on the inside and the outside. One of the other great debates, of course, is the fact that this is the first Ferrari available with an automatic transmission. Of course, that alone was heresy in its day. So we have here two examples, this blue one with the automatic transmission and this bronze one with the five-speed manual. When I was in school, many of my schoolmates would cringe when the teacher said, okay, we're going to write a book report and we want you to compare and contrast. I loved it. I still love it to this day. In fact, you'll see in a lot of the exhibitions that we do here at the Audrain, we do a lot of comparing and contrasting. It could be fun. It's a way to learn. It's a way to appreciate things that you might not have appreciated before. 
and I'm going to do that exactly today with this pair of Ferrari 400i's. We're going to drive this manual car and drive the automatic and we'll see if the stories they tell are true or not. Here behind the wheel of the 1984 400i with the five-speed gearbox, immediately it feels like a 1980s Italian luxury sports car. The controls are very heavy, of course. The clutch is uh, something that would probably break the leg of somebody used to a uh, Japanese or Korean car. And um, it's, uh, it is the experience more or less that you'd expect on a car like this, but you're also surrounded by all of this leather. I mean, swaths and swaths and swaths of leather and, and this big windshield and this, and this substantial wheel and uh, somehow it just seems slightly unseemly that you have to row through the gears yourself. You, know, you should have a person for that, you know. Um, but it does take off from rest like a Ferrari should. The gearbox has a great naughty but secure feel that you really want. There is a certain disconnect between the fairly soft ride the, the heft that you feel in driving this car, which is, again is very much a part of the 400, and, uh, and shifting gears. There is an immediacy to the power band on this uh, engine, however, that, that really rewards picking the right gear because it, it behaves much like, although it is obviously a big Italian V12, it behaves much like an American V8 in terms of its responsiveness. Here at 2,000 RPM and third gear, now I'm down to second, and it just it just goes. And then there's the sound. You know, there's nothing like having a big, comfortable car with that wonderful sound. The quintessence of the Ferrari experience is a front-engine V12, and the fact that these cars have been for a very long time so reasonably priced is just another gift, quite frankly. Um, but nevertheless, the market is slowly waking up to these cars, and uh, I think deservedly so. One of the very interesting things, of course, about the, uh, this 400 is the fact that although there's this absolutely beautiful leather boot on the shifter, when you're shifting it, you still feel that steel gate. That's a real sign of a Ferrari of this age. It's a very deliberate shift, nothing vague, very, very, very mechanical, very precise. And it's very rewarding in, in, in so many ways to, to use this gearbox. This 400i five-speed is also running on the metric Michelin TRX tires. And they're really fantastic tires. They have great grip. And also, they are a good mix between the modern, very square shoulder tire and the softer rounded tires that preceded them. And so they give you a, a nice, soft, predictable turn in without that sort of sharp edge you get on the more modern tires, which can be really annoying. So it's really terrific that uh, this car has maintained that. Many of the cars that were delivered with the metric wheels have been swapped for the conventional wheels so you can have much wider tire choice. But, you know, this really does suit the car. Um, I also have to say again that um, this car feels uh, much like a car of the 1990s, even though it was a car that was designed back in the 70s. Um, Fioravanti and Pininfarina did a very, very good job of the ergonomics in this car. Um, as the car progressed from the 365 through the 400 to the 400i, then to the 412, the interiors were developed uh, quite a bit along the way. And even between uh, different examples of the 400, this uh, one has a totally different arrangement of vents, uh, much more modern and, and integrated. Uh, this Ferrari model is also the first to have dual air conditioning. It's a big car with a lot of glass, and so it was always very helpful to be able to cool the backseat passengers because you had backseat passengers who needed cooling. Um, it's a very practical car in a way that you don't think of a Ferrari being practical, and um, it's not a bad thing. Pulling off from uh, a stop, in the Ferrari 400i A, or automatic, is certainly a lot easier than it is in the uh, five-speed car. It's effortless, in fact. Uh, just what you imagine uh, Ferrari and Pininfarina intended 
uh, for this car. And, you know, it's a very funny thing. Uh, back in the day, the great driver Derek Bell road tested a Porsche 928 for a car magazine. And it was rather controversial when he declared that the automatic transmission in that Porsche really suited the car well. And he thought, frankly, better than the five-speed transmission in the car because it suited the character of the car better. And I feel a similar way, frankly, about the Ferrari 400. As a continent crosser, as a car that I would get into this car today here in Rhode Island and drive to California effortlessly. You know, it would be comfortable, it would be easy to do, and yet, it still is a Ferrari. I mean, feeling that turbo hydromatic transmission on a kickdown and a Ferrari V12 is a pretty special thing. Compared to the 365 and the 412 that followed, the 400 is a little down on power. About 311 horsepower was the rating back then. And, but it still seems like more than enough to move this car. The 400 was also equipped with a wonderful self-leveling rear suspension, which helps in the ride. And also, obviously, it was intended to be a car that you'd put a, a load full of luggage in the trunk for a long trip. And uh, it really does impact the handling of the car uh, in a way, in a positive way, in a very positive way. And what is really interesting about the 400, the fact that it's the first Ferrari available with an automatic transmission and a nice comfortable big cruiser, it seemed unnatural for the U.S. market, yet Ferrari never sold it in the U.S. All the examples that are here were either gray market imports during the time, as was the one that I'm driving right now, or imported much later as collector cars. And it's a shame because this is a car that really did suit the American market. The story is that Enzo Ferrari didn't think that he wanted to keep catching up with the ever-tightening federal regulations for emissions and safety, and that the expense of it for the number of these cars that he would sell was not worth it. So that the V8s would be sufficient in the U.S. market. So for quite a while, it was only V8 Ferraris that were sold, and at a certain point, actually, only the 308 GT4 was the only Ferrari sold in America. But nonetheless, we can enjoy it now. And of course, it's also quite interesting <laughs> with this particular car, which was federalized in period. It's got an 85 mile per hour speedometer. Of course, the national speed limit was 55. Manufacturers were forbidden to put speedometers that read more than 85. And here on this Ferrari speedometer is an orange line that starts at 85 and goes down to the normal 160 that the factory speedometer would read. Now, of course, I can't demonstrate here in a legal manner on these local roads what you can do, but just take my word for it. Even though the speedometer stops at 85, this car certainly doesn't. So I've had a chance to compare and contrast. And my choice? Well, quite frankly, I take either of them. They both have a certain appeal that makes them really desirable. The five-speed car is eager and, and on, the, on the button, the way you expect a Ferrari V12 with a five-speed transmission to be. But the automatic is no slouch. The turbo hydromatic transmission really suits the power band of the big Ferrari 412 quite well and lets you use those 311 horsepower to the maximum. There's nothing like that kick down. So I think it's no surprise that these cars are no longer the forgotten Ferraris, but the found Ferraris. Hi, it's Donald with this week's Audrain Auto Museum Fun Fast Fact Quiz Question. The Ferrari 400 was the first car from the brand to be offered with an automatic transmission in 1976. However, what year and by whom and where was the first automatic transmission invented? If you think you know the answer, please write it in our comments below. You'll find out the answer in our next posted video. Good luck. If you like these videos, let your friends know. Subscribe, comment, share.